enthusiastically welcome tonight's speaker, Anna. is because I want to make sure that you all know that we are in this together. Um, that's why I, I normally, if you go to meetings with me, you'll hear me say I'm an alcoholic. My name is Hannah for that reason. Um, I have a sobriety date number. Oh, sorry. Thank you for, well, Mike's not here. He called me and said he would miss me because he didn't want to hear me speak. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. He didn't say that, but um, he did call me to say good luck and um, he'll listen to the tape. Um, my sobriety date is March 1st of 2009. I celebrated 15 years this past March, and I really, I don't know how it happened. Um, well, it happened by me doing the work, working the steps, getting a sponsor, and doing all the things that are recommended, suggested that we do. Um, well, I was told that it was going to be very bright, and I feel kind of like there is no podium covering me. I feel exposed. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, so, I do not come... I spoke about two months ago, so if you already heard me, I'm sorry. Um, it is my story, but I'll try to switch it up a little bit because, you know, not everything in a story can be covered in an hour. So, I have a lot more than I can say. So, let's see what my higher power has in mind to come through my mouth. I always pray first and ask my higher power to speak through me and walk in front of me um, in any situation of life. And that seems to help. So, I grew up in not an alcoholic home, but I did have a, it did have a lot of isms. Um, you know, I grew up never knowing what was right or what was wrong when I did something. It was like somebody telling you, pick door A, and I would pick door A, and then it would be like, why did you pick door A? And, you know, I, I never knew, I never felt comfortable. Um, you know, it was a very loving home, don't take me wrong, but it was just, it was confusing. Um, you know, I, like a lot of you, I've heard your stories and it's similar that I didn't feel like I, you know, like I belong. I. I thought that if I was blonde, well, I am now, but not real. Um, if I was blonde and had blue eyes, I would be happier. You know, I didn't like that I had dark brown eyes and dark hair. Um, so I always compare myself with other people. I was grew up being really, really shy. I did not start drinking like the majority of you did. So that kept me from acknowledging that I was an alcoholic for a long time because I was about 16 when I drank. Most of you would tell me your stories and you're like, you know, six, 12, 14. And I figured, well, I was a lot older. I was 16. Um, I'm not gonna tell you that when I started drinking, it automatic, the disease automatically woke up in me. Um, it took me a while, you know? I mean, I, I always have done everything to an extent. Um, to an extreme, I'm sorry, always, you know, I, I suffer from what is called the disease of more, you know, I can't just watch one Netflix show, I have to watch the whole thing, and um, so I always suffer from that, I want, always wanted more, and I remember the first time I drank, it felt like, oh, you know, I wasn't shy anymore, and I felt, my, it gave me self-confidence, it was that liquid courage that I discovered. But it took, it took me a few years to get to the point where I really belonged here. Um, you know, I, I started drinking on the weekends, partying with my friends, you know, watching soccer tournaments. And then eventually it was, you know, Friday night and then Thursday night and then every night. And, you know, I was joke about, I always said I'll never drink before noon. And then one day I figured, well, it's noon somewhere in the world. So I started drinking and, you know, it took me a few years to get to the point where it was a lot of despair. Um, you know, I did things I didn't want to do, but before the disease really woke up in me, I didn't know who I was. 
I would do everything everybody else, or I thought everybody else wanted me to, to be because I wanted you to like me. You know, so I was very codependent and I was a people pleaser. Um, I heard somebody say once, you know, my name is so-and-so and I'm a people pleaser, is that okay? You know, and that's how I was. <laughs> that's how I was. So, um, you know, I, I didn't know who I was. I, I thought I knew, but I re didn't really. Um, I would smoke a certain brand of cigarettes and I started hanging out with a group of people that smoked a different brand of cigarettes and I would switch. The same thing with my drinking, you know, if somebody was drinking a type of drink, I would switch to that. Um, met somebody else that was drinking something else, I would switch to that. It was always changing to whoever I was hanging out with. It was never my own. When I started drinking a lot more and was really under the influence and the uh, power of master alcohol, you know, then I became a box of wine drinker because it was a lot easier to do that. You know, I, I couldn't do the cork thing and, and I would get the twist offs and then I was, I was buying too many bottles and they clanked too much in the trash can. So I just bought boxes of wine, you know, and I always had them lined up and my favorite was White Zinfandel. Um, but it, it took me, like I said, it took me a while to get there. Um, I got married to a real alcoholic I really should not have married this man. The only reason why I started going out with him is because my car broke down. I went back to work because I couldn't start it. They said, oh, talk to that guy. He works on cars. So I went and then he helped me fix my car. But then I also knew, learned how much he liked to party. And I'm like, oh, you know, I, and it's like, I, I look for my kind of people. Like now in recovery, I look for people in recovery. Back then, I would look for people that could party like me, you know, and I figure, oh, it's free. So, you know, and I mean, I like the guy, don't take me wrong, but it wasn't really, it, it, I was in that relationship for 16 years, so I know how to maintain it. Um, but it took me about four years to finally leave him. It was, he, he stopped drinking a couple of times, but he was very dry. And I thought I was helping him by drinking more so he wouldn't finish it all. You know, I thought, well, if I drink more, then he won't drink as much and I can control it. Because that's my big thing. I, I like control. And I think I'm God or thought. Um, and if I do things a certain way, then I will get the results I want. And when I didn't get the results I wanted, I would get upset. Which doing the, the steps, you know, it really taught me what kind of person I was. And I was very surprised, and I'll get into that in a minute. But um, so this ex-husband of mine, you know, we finally decided, I finally decided that I couldn't do this anymore. You know, we had a child, and for a long time I stayed in this relationship because I, my mom came, I came from, my mom was married a few times, and of course, you know, later I follow her footsteps. But um, I, I thought that it would be the best thing to just stay with, the, child, the father of my child because I didn't want them to grow up in a broken home. But then I realized that I was actually showing them that it was okay to be in a relationship that was really not good. And it wasn't, it just wasn't healthy. Mentally, uh, emotionally, it wasn't healthy. So he went to several rehabs throughout a relationship and I went ahead and dropped him off at this sober living home and Dana Point, and it was March 17th of 1999, which is St. Patrick's Day. So I called my girlfriend and I said, hey, let's go out and celebrate, but I'm finally free. And um, she was like, are you sure? Why don't we just drink here? And I said, no, 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 I gotta go out. So we went out and we went to like three, four bars, closed the bars, and by the time we were going home, it was two o'clock in the morning, and um, I swerved on the road because there were cones and I got stopped by a cop and then the second cop came and I didn't pass the drug, the um, drunk test and they took my car and took me to jail. Um, well, the police station. This was in 1999. Things were not as bad as now. You know, I, I got a slap in the hand. She walked home because she could not she would not get the cops give her a ride. They offer her, she's like, I'm not getting in a cop car. So she was pretty drunk herself, but she wasn't driving. So her boyfriend came to the police station and, and took, you know, got me out. Um, I never went to jail on that one. I lost my license for 30 days. Um, I learned my lesson, I really did, for about, 
I don't even know, six months maybe. I would, I would, I had discovered bars, obviously, because I went to a bar that night. I discovered bars because I never went to bars before. I would go to clubs, and it was classier, I guess. And um, I discovered bars, and I discovered darts, and that was my passion. So I would go to bars, and I would drink, and I, and I would, eat. if I didn't have a ride, and I was driving, I would not drink. You know, and the bartenders knew me, so they would give me a pitcher of water with lemon, and that's what I would do. And I thought I was doing really well. See, I'm not an alcoholic. Um, when I started going to meetings, because during that the UI, the judge sent me to AA, and I walked into my first meeting, which I didn't know anything about, you know, because to me, alcoholics were those people that are standing in a corner, filthy, dirty, with a brown paper bag. To me, that was an alcoholic. I don't come from that background, right? You know, I had education, I came from a good family, and, um, so I went to my first meeting and I had just bought a house uh, a few months prior. And I went to this meeting and the person leading the meeting was my neighbor. I'm like, oh, I know somebody here. And you know, he saw me too, it was like, hey, hey. You know, we weren't really friends because I had just moved in a couple months ago. But I got a resentment right away because I didn't know what to say. So when I, they said, introduce yourself, I said, well, my name is Anna. And the judge said, I have to come. And they all started laughing. And I was just like, oh my God, there's, this is not nice. You know, this is not funny. And then they started talking about God. And I got my second resentment because you're not gonna tell me what I believe or not believe. Now, I grew up very Catholic. I went to boarding school, so I knew everything about it. And I had a great relationship with God, but because they told me I had to have one, that completely, it was like, nope, I don't belong here. This is a cult. Um, well, me and this guy became really good friends. Um, he was one of those guys that had been going to rehab since he was 12. He was probably 37 at the time, give or take. And um, he didn't have a job. His family was rich. So his garage was his you know, party room. He had a couch, a fridge, a TV, the whole thing. So, and the whole neighborhood and people he grew up with were hung out there. And I always thought, you know, well, you know, he's the neighborhood drunk and I'm being nice, I'm keeping him company. And, you know, six in the morning, I would go to, you know, he would open the garage, I would go there and we would start drinking. Um, I completely forgot that I had a child that I had to take care of. Um, you know, my mother would tell me that my kid was not a dog. I couldn't just throw food at, at them and expect to be a mother. I thought that I was present because I worked from home since my kid was born and you know, I'm like, well, I'm home, right? But I wasn't really. I mean, physically I was, unless I was across the street. And even the UPS driver would come to the garage to deliver my packages because he knew I was never home. Um, so anyways, you know, life got worse. You know, relationships got worse. Um, you know, I met somebody that was drinking and driving and I thought, well, it's been enough time since I've been drinking and driving, so I'll, he's doing it, I can do it. You know, and, and that just got me to another level. Um, I, uh, I met somebody that was not sober when I met him. And then when I saw him again a couple months later, he was sober. And I really like this guy. So, you know, he's, you know, of course, because my history, I have, like I said, if you do something, I'll do it too. So because he wasn't drinking, I said, yeah, I won't drink either. And, but because we met at a bar, uh, we kept going to the bar, and then the bartender would just brew us a, a pot of coffee. And I think it lasted about two months. We would come in and play darts, and then, it, you know, he would brew the pot of coffee. And then one day he looked at me and said, you know, if you really don't think you're an alcoholic, you can drink. It didn't take me two seconds, and I traded my coffee mug for a beer, beer mug. And um, I think it was a, two days later, maybe a week or less, that he started drinking too. And then I got a resentment because I'm like, oh, you tricked me. You wanted me to drink first so you could say I started drinking. Um, and then that, for the next two years, our relationship was a nightmare because it was all about alcohol. I would promise that I would not drink. I would make all those promises, you know, or I would say, okay, I won't drink hard liquor, that's my issue. 
And I, I really intended to keep those promises, but then when he went to the bathroom, I would run to the bartender and say, please give me three shots really, really quick. And then, you know, I'm watching the door and I'm, you know, trying to manage it and then drink the three shots and then go back to the table and he would come out of the bathroom and 15 minutes later, he's like, you drank more than you. And I'm like, no, I didn't. You know, he goes, I can tell because my attitude changes, you know, because then when I start feeling that buzz, I want more. You know, it's never enough. When I first came in here, you guys would say that, you know, one drink is you drunk. And I thought, you guys have no clue how to drink. And he goes, it takes a lot more than one drink for me to get drunk. But I get it. You know, I get it. The thing is, once I have one drink, I cannot stop. I just want more and more and more. And, um, you know, somebody, uh, somebody says something that I'll do anything in sobriety. I'll do anything not to have that first drink but I'll give everything up for the second. And, and that is true, you know, that is true. And that was me for a long time. Um, that boyfriend got sentenced to AA and I came with him, you know, honey, I'll be supportive. I'll go to meetings with you. And, you know, the truth is, and I didn't, I didn't realize this until I was doing steps with my sponsor and she brought it up to my attention that, I didn't come to AA because I wanted to be supportive. I came to AA because I couldn't trust him as far as I could throw him. Now, because, you know, I'm good, and he wasn't. That's the story that I told my head, myself. I was talking to my grand sponsor just this last February, and I mentioned that, you know, we were all telling her our story to get to know her a little better. And so I said, yeah, I came in with my boyfriend, and I couldn't trust him as far as I could throw him. And she said, really? Why is that? And I'm like, well, because he did stuff. And he goes, you sure? You know, I'm, I'm like, oh my God. And then he goes, well, normally, when somebody can't trust somebody, it's because they're not trustworthy themselves. So what did you do? And I was like, I didn't do anything. You know, and then I remember, when I met this guy, I had a boyfriend. I cheated on my boyfriend with him. <laughs> so, you know, for me to just get on my high horse and say, well, I can't trust him, you know, what had I done? Right? So it was, it's really easy to look outward and say it's your fault and your fault and your fault. But what I've learned with the steps that I, it, it's gold for me is that I, I can look at myself today and I accept everything that I've done and everything that I can do and how I can change. Um, sorry, I have my phone because there's a couple things that I wanted to say. And there is, there's one thing that somebody it was a young people's meeting and somebody had said, and I'm gonna paraphrase, she said, you know, the answer of this program and how this works is in the book. It's three little words that are right at the beginning of page 112. So find out what it is. And then if you have time before the line, uh, during the line, you can tell me what that is. And if you don't, I'll tell you. Um, you know, but there are certain things in this program that that when I first saw the steps on the wall, I thought I could pick and choose, like if it was a buffet, right? Oh, I can do one, and I can do six, and I can do this. And my sponsor, you know, I finally got a sponsor because the boyfriend was like, if you're gonna just go to meetings and, and sit in a chair, I'm not taking you. Well, I couldn't have that happen, so I got a sponsor. And um, there, I had a, uh, um, I have one of those spiritual moments when I went, we met this group in Long Beach, and it was a family group, and they did a lot of activities, and they invited us to be part of their group for this weekend in Palm Desert. And we went, and it was the, it was the strangest feeling to walk through that gate and be completely sober. I had never got anywhere completely sober. I would always have to drink before I got there, you know, or have a bottle in my purse, because I knew they weren't gonna have enough for me to get to the state that I wanted or needed to get to. Um, my plan that weekend before I got there was that that Sunday when I got back home, I was done with this program because it wasn't really working. You guys were liars. I wasn't feeling that joy, happy, joy and free feeling. And I was going to drink and hide it. That was my plan. Well, during that weekend, they had a women's meeting. You know, they divided us in men and women. And this lady said something that really... I really heard her, you know, she said, you're here. And she, I thought she was talking to me, but she was talking to everybody. She goes, you're standing on the beam, you know, and on one side of it is active alcoholism. On the other side is recovery. Which are you going to choose? And I thought, oh my God, I've been doing this dance for three and a half months already. I haven't drank. 
whether I want to or not. You know, and my reason for not drinking was because he was in a lot of legal issues, troubled, and I did not want to tempt him or have alcohol in my house in case the you know uh, police came and looked around, and, and I didn't want to be the reason why he went to prison. So that's why I was not drinking. Um, and then I realized it's been three and a half months. Maybe they have something here. So I called my sponsor and I said, when I get back from this trip, I want to do the, I want to do this deal the best that I can. And this lady girl, <laughs> she was a girl, she was like, I don't know, 25 years younger than me and she already had over 10 years of sobriety. She got sober really young and she had what I wanted, you know. Um, so I started working with her and everything was going great. First step, second step, third step got to the fourth step, and it really gave me an empowering feeling to make that list of the people I resented and to write down the column of what they did to me and to write what it made me feel. You know, I really was enjoying it. It was like, yes, those people. And, um, and then it was my, you know, where was I wrong? Where was I selfish? And, and those things that you write in the fourth column. And I looked at her and I said, no, I didn't do anything. It was them, you know, it was that girl because of this, or it was that guy because of this, and, you know, my kid because of this, and, you know, my boss because of that, and it took, I don't recommend this, please, for your new people, but I sat on that for six months, um, until she told me that if I didn't get going with it and have it done in two weeks, she couldn't sponsor me anymore. However, I did not have a problem with contacting my boyfriend's sponsor and writing his four step because I had a feeling that he was not going to be honest with him. So it was my job and my duty to make sure he knew everything about it. And, uh, and then I had a resentment against that guy, too, because I asked him, please don't tell him. Please don't tell him. I, of course I won't. He did. You know, he did. So, um, and I didn't find out that he did for a long time. But, but I did get a resentment about that. Um, so I continued on the steps, you know, I think when I, when I did my fifth step, you know, I thought that I was going to never, I thought I was going to hold on to something because I could not tell one person everything about me. And then she was going to think I was this awful person for the thoughts that I had or for some of the actions that I did. And it was actually really good. You know, I would read something to her and then she would tell me something she did and it was more like a conversation you know I did this too and this is what I did and this is how I felt and you know and I was like oh I'm not that bad you know however the big thing that came out of my fifth step is that I'm a very self-seeking person self-seeking was written all over it you know I thought that because I was nice to you I was being a good person and, and it is, I am a good person, you know, it's not to say I'm not, but my motives were not right. I was doing something for you, so when I needed something, you better be good to me too. And if you didn't, then I would get a resentment, because what do you mean, you know? And I learned that from my mother, because that's how she was, and that's how, you know, I learned to live life, you know? You learn from where you grow up, and that was it. And... Um, so I learned that being self-seeking, and, and then I learned that there were so many different ways of being self-seeking. You know, gossiping was part of being self-seeking, you know, and I learned that it is, because when I gossip, I'm trying to get you on my side, and that's why I'm saying it. You know, I'm trying to maneuver, manipulate people so I'm the best thing they've ever met, and they like me and will do anything I need them to do for me. Um, and it was eye-opening, you know, I kind of felt slap in the face a little bit, to be honest, because here I thought this whole time, you know, I've been a goody two-shoes my whole life. Nobody suspected that I was a drunk. And I actually felt proud of that. When people realized how much I liked to party, they were like, you? I'm like, yep, me, you know, and because I was. I mean, I, I never looked like the party girl, you know. I, it was very under the covers kind of thing. Um, you know, on this, on the, on the, re, on our readings, it says, rarely has a, rarely has a person failed who has followed, who has thoroughly followed our path. And I didn't believe that for a long time, because I wasn't following the path. 
You know, I, they were telling me, just go to meetings, don't drink, and life will get better. And I was going to meetings, not drinking, and life sucked. And that's because I wasn't doing anything else. If this program was just about putting out the drink, we wouldn't need to be here. But it's about looking at life through a different pair of glasses, like Chuck C says. You know, it's just looking at what you can do. If you look at the 12 steps, the only step that talks about alcohol is step one. The rest is all about being a good person, being honest, be kind, you know, make amends. Um, be of service, you know, all those things that that is a good person does without having to do a program, you know. If everybody in the world would do the steps, I think we would have a better world, but that's a different thing. Um, so, yeah, it is true, you know. If you do everything that is suggested here, it does work. And the people that say it doesn't work is because they're not willing to do what it takes. And, and, and I can say I wasn't willing either for a while because it was too much pain. I didn't want to go through the pain. I didn't want to see myself as this person that, you know, that was awful, you know, or all the lies I would say. You know, today when I lie, I don't feel comfortable, which is really weird because I will lie all the time. Um, I remember when, um, the day that my boyfriend had to go to court, I didn't call in, I worked from home, but I didn't call in and told my boss. I just went to court with him. And then, you know, the whole sentence thing, and you know, it was a, it was a, a huge deal that day. So I was in my head a lot. And then I, I had all these messages on my cell phone and everybody's looking for me at work. Are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay? It took me 30 minutes walking in the parking lot trying to come up with a story of what I was going to tell him of why I did not call him. And this is the best I came up with. My boyfriend was arrested, which he wasn't, and I went to visit him at jail this morning and I didn't know that there was a warrant for my arrest so they arrested me too. It took me so long to come up with that. Instead of just like today I know, just tell the truth. Just tell the truth. You know, it hurts for a little bit, but then it's, it's better, you know, and I go through that. And sometimes I still need to work on something because nobody's perfect. I mean, we're not God. And sometimes, you know, I still go back to my Catholic roots where it's like, it's a little white lie, but a lie is a lie is a lie. You know, it's either a lie by omission because I don't want to say something because they're going to get mad at me, or it's a lie by just not wanting to be honest. And, you know, sometimes I have to watch that. That's part of my character defects. Uh, my sponsor always says that character defects are character assets out of proportion. And that is true because we can turn those defects into assets, you know, and, and I believe as, um, Oh my God, the writer of, um, I can't think of his name, Charles Dickens, no. There's somebody that says to be, um, to tell the truth, you don't have to remember anything. You can look it up and it tells you who it is. I'm blocking it right now. But that is true. You don't have to remember anything. When I would lie and then I forgot who I told what, oh my God, that was so much work. That was so much work. So, um, you know, but the thing is, in this program, if you do what is suggested, you know, life changed for me, you know, and it's not necessarily that life got better because life is lifey and life will have issues, you know, lose jobs, um, have arguments, people pass away. I mean, there's things that happen before I would drink on any of those occasions, any of them, you know, either to celebrate or to grieve, I would drink. But today, I don't have to do that anymore. You know, today I can just put one foot in front of the other and do the right thing. And like I was saying, it's not that life got better, it got different. But what got completely different is my reaction to life. That's what changed by me doing what is suggested. You know, and then one of my favorite steps is step three. Um, and it says right in there on the 12 and 12. Uh, three. It says, in fact, the effectiveness of this whole AA program will rest upon how well and earnestly we have tried to come to a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. It doesn't say that you find him. 
it's a process of seeking. Because if I find a God that is, okay, this is my God and this is, this is good, I'm shorting myself. Because God, my higher power is always evolving, always evolving. You know, and sometimes when things don't go right for me, I have to ask myself, at what point did I let go of the hand of my higher power? Because that's when I get in trouble, is when I take control of the reins again and I think I know better. Because for a long time I did. It was like, well, how did I God really know what I need? I know what I need, you know, but I really didn't, you know, and then I was able to look at my life and see all the times that my higher power was sending me in one direction, and I clearly took another, clearly took another. Um, I remember one time I was at the freeway exit. I had to make a right to go to our girlfriend's house. We were going to watch some English Channel movies, and the thought came, but if I make a left, I go to the bar with that friend of mine that I had met and got that DUI with. And I was like, yeah, but I told her I would come over. Yeah, but I can go have fun. And I made a left and I went and have fun, you know, and I didn't care that she was worried about me. She waited to, for me for a couple hours, didn't know where I was. You know, it goes, once I make that decision to drink, nothing else matters, you know? And, and I also thought that I wasn't hurting anybody but myself. That's such a crock. Um, a lies it is because I've had plenty of blackouts in my days and I've been told that it's better that I keep him as blackouts because I really don't want to know um, but there are some things that I remember I remember coming out of a blackout once with the police right here in front of me you know and he was like hello lady hello hello and I'm like you know and I came to and I was like where am I and what's going on uh, I came out of another blackout in the hallway of my house, fighting with my kid. I'm pulling my purse one way, they're pulling my purse the other way, because I wanted to go to the store and get more, some, more to drink. Um, and I remember they, they finally let go of the purse, and as I'm pulling, I fell backwards, and they were like, just go do whatever you want, Mom. I don't care anymore. You know, and I remember getting drunk and then started yelling at my mother and she would say, you're making a scene because everything's about appearances. And I opened the window and started yelling at the neighbors, you know, and just say, now this is a scene, you know, and things that I don't really remember doing much, except when I started working the steps and I went all the way back, I remember, you know, yes, I did damage people. It wasn't just me, you know, it was all kinds of people around in my life. Uh, that I damaged. You know, when I came to make amends, uh, the only person that I had last on my list was my brother. And it wasn't because I didn't want to make the amends to him. It was because he wrote me a letter asking when I was going to make amends to him. And then I was like, <laughs> well, you're going last on the list, buddy. <laughs> you know, and, and sadly, me and him don't have a really close relationship. He's 13 years younger than me, and he's one of us. And he's gotten in several troubles and DUIs. And I kind of have a resentment against him. And my sponsor was like, why? I'm like, because he gets to still get to do whatever he wants and he's not paying the price. Why? I had to pay the price, you know? But if I really think about it, I don't want his life. I want mine. You know, I wouldn't give up the life that I have today for anything. I mean, today I have a great group of friends. When we moved here in September 2nd, 2021, it was scary because all my sobriety was in California. I had a solid group of women that I did stuff with, a lot of stuff. And it was hard. And my sponsor at the time said, you need to promise me that when you go to meetings, you're gonna act as if you were a newcomer. You're gonna raise your hand, you're gonna introduce yourself, and you're gonna say hello. And I started doing that. And, you know, I would raise my hand to sponsor. Nobody would ask me. And I was like, this sucks. You know, and I'm like, they're asking all these other people but me. And then all of a sudden, people started asking me. You know, and I have a solid group of sponsees in other states because, you know, several people moved away. Uh, and I'm grateful and I'm blessed because just two weeks ago, two of my sponsees surprised me and came down here to take their 12 and 13 year chip. Um, and showed up at my women's meeting and I didn't have a clue that it was happening. So that was a good surprise. And, then, and that's something that if I wasn't sober today, I wouldn't get. I wouldn't have the relationships I have today. You know, because when I was out there drinking, yeah, sure, people 
wanted to drink with me and party, but even my bar friends towards the end didn't want nothing to do with me. We would go out in a boat to Catalina, and they were like, but Anna's going to pass out in the middle of the ocean. And I did. You know, I wasn't fun anymore. You know, if I went to the bathroom, they had to run before me and go to the bathroom first because I had a tendency to pass out in the bathroom with the door locked and nobody could come in. Um, so, you know, it wasn't even fun. It wasn't fun for me. It wasn't fun for them. I didn't have any friends um, because I was burning every bridge I had. You know, I wasn't even a good drunk. So, you know, today, like I said, I have a good number of sponsees. I have a great relationship with them. I love walking other women through the steps because every time I do that, I'm redoing the steps myself. Um, I am an AA junkie. I go to as many retreats, conference, conventions that I can go. I'm very blessed that I've been able to do that. I'm very blessed that my husband also likes to do that. Um, we are in January, it'll be 18 years that we'll be together, and on Saturday, um, we'll be celebrating 11 years of marriage. You know, and for that, I'm also grateful. Because when we first got here, both we wanted to split, and both our sponsors said, no, nope, you have to stick it up for a year. Because you don't know what you want. You're not in any shape or um, mental capacity to make a decision. You know, and it was still hard for a little bit, but we decided to, you know, just stick with it, and. You know, and now, you know, he's my husband, and you guys know him as the medallion stallion. <laughs> you know, but we're, you know, and, I, and I'm kind of proud of ourselves, actually, and it's not to pat myself on the back, but there's not a lot of couples that come in together and stay. You know, we came in with two years of drunken stupor fights with us, and we were able to make it. And the reason why we were able to make it is because I let him do finally his own program and concentrated on mine. Because for a long time, I remember we moved to South Orange County and I was like, are you gonna find meetings? And he's like, yeah. You know, and he wasn't, I wasn't seeing it. So I printed a spreadsheet with all the local meetings and printed it and gave it to him. You know, and because I have control issues still. You know, I still today have to really, when I first came in, my sponsor said I was not allowed to talk. If I wanted to, because I couldn't shut up, I would always have to say something. And I still do. I'm sure he'll tell you I still do. But, you know, but, but I literally had to put my hand over my mouth in order not to talk. And of course, everybody knew what that meant because at you know, first it was like, why is she covering her mouth? Oh, you know, but now I don't have to cover my mouth and I know that I can just take a deep breath and not say anything. Um, there is a little trick that a sponsor of mine showed me that you have to ask yourself three questions when you feel that you have to get involved in something or say something. The answer for all three questions have to be yes or you cannot do it. One is, does it have to be said? Yeah. Does it have to be said now? Yeah. Does it have to be said now by me? That third one always gets me. No, it doesn't. You know, I, I'm not the ruler of the universe. Uh, I also thought that being sarcastic was witty until I was told that sarcasm comes from a Greek word that means tearing the flesh. And I don't see being sarcastic as the same anymore because I really don't want to tear anybody's flesh with my, my mouth. Um, yeah, I mean, life is wonderful. It really is. You know, I'm not going to tell you that I never think of drinking, but I don't think of drinking as wanting to drink. What I think of drinking today is if something goes wrong, like, for example, right now I'm going through some stuff. They're letting go a few people in my company. I know that I'm not indispensable. So I'm mentally preparing myself where if that day comes, then I'm not going to be, oh, my God. Um, you know, so I'm kind of mentally preparing myself. They keep telling me it's not me, but you never know, right? Um, but right now, if, it, if I was thinking like in the past, I will be drinking. I don't know if I'm going to get fired or not. Life sucks. I need to drink, right? Well, today, what I think is, oh, boy, if I were drinking right now, I'd really screw up my life even more. That's how I think of drinking today. You know, as I think of what it could do and how bad it would damage me. And I honestly, I, the one fear I have that is the strongest fear is a fear of relapse. I don't want to go back to that life. 
I, I really don't. You know, number one is because nobody's guaranteed another recovery. You know, the ones of you that come back, you're blessed. So I hope that you take that opportunity. I never went to rehab, um, you know, just because it wasn't meant for me to do that way. My life happened exactly as I needed it to. You know, and sometimes people say, well, don't you wish your life would have been different? And I honestly don't. Because I wouldn't be here today if my life hadn't been the way that it was. Every step of the way. You know, every pain, every suffering, you know, every, every drunken, horrible moment, they all had to happen for me to be here today. Um, you know, I want to I wanna end with this, and I don't know if you've heard me say this, I haven't said it in a while, but um, a friend of mine gave me this a while ago, and this is just, it's the 12 steps in reverse. It's a path to relapse instead of a path to recovery. 12. Having detached us spiritually because of ignoring these steps, we let our fellow alcoholics fend for themselves and practice these principles sporadically. 11. Let our conscious contact with God as we understood him lapse by praying only in emergencies for our will to be carried out. 10. Oops, sorry. 10. Slacked off on personal inventory and when we were wrong, denied or hid it. 9. Reason that no one had been hurt by us more than we had been hurt by them and called it even. Sorry, this thing is not... <clears throat> Eight, made a game of rationalizing the harm we had done to others. Seven, sang, I've got to be me. Some of you older people will get that one. <laughs> um, six, decided that our defects of characters were too much to fun to give up. Too much fun to give up. Five, denied to us, to God, and to everybody else that we had ever done anything harmful. Four, quickly cast a weak flashlight over a moral inventory. Three, made a decision to keep our will and our lives totally in our own control. Two, came to believe that since our troubles were of our own making, we, should have, we would have to solve them without outside help. One, we decided that we could control alcohol and, and or drug use that our lives were, unma were manageable. And that is true, because that is how I've heard, I've, I've had sponsees that have gone back out and they start doing that. They do all the 12 steps and they're doing great and then they just start going backwards. You know, they stop being of service. They stop having a spiritual connection and all those things. I don't know if you have a higher power or not. Um, you can choose, you know, a group of drunks. Um, there is one more that I heard a long time ago, which is, Another uh, meaning for God is guaranteed overnight delivery. And I really believe in that because when I really pray for God's will, not for mine, because for a long time I was praying for mine, um, you know, it works. Just one piece of advice, don't choose a doorknob because that turns, that turns on you. So thank you for letting me share.